All right, everyone. Hello. Good morning. Good afternoon. Good evening, wherever you are in the world. My name is Jason Levine, and it is a pleasure to have you back here on Adobe Live, Behance, Creative Cloud, YouTube, Premiere Pro, Facebook, and Twitter Periscope for day three of our special Adobe Video Livestream series. This is in lieu of NAB. We couldn't be at the show, of course. None of us are at the show. There is no show this year. So we wanted to bring you something a little bit different, a little bit more... Um, I wouldn't say, well, yeah, kind of exclusive because you're getting a firsthand look at some new things that we just released across the applications. In fact, uh, this Tuesday, we just had a big release and update for all the DVA apps, but we are also featuring product team members and amazing customers showing off their incredible work and actually having conversations. That's really the point of what this week is all about, is allowing you to engage directly with Adobe team members and with our customers. First time ever for this on this scale. Now, as I mentioned, we're coming to you across five different networks. So you've got chats everywhere. We've got Adobe people monitoring and moderating and answering your questions in the chats. I will be forwarding our, your chat questions to our guests. But we really want to drive you to Adobe Live. So if you want to go to behance.net slash Adobe Live, Lots of Adobe people in there getting ready to answer your questions in real time, as well as on the Premiere Pro Facebook page. But again, I'm monitoring all the chats everywhere, so um, I too will be able to answer your questions and say hello and do all those kinds of things. All right, so without further ado, let's go ahead and get into it. My first guest this morning is a Premiere Pro product manager, former colorist, super cool guy. Uh, he's someone who, um, again, I'm so excited to have on the show here today. And uh, he's coming to us from, of course, his remote location. And his name is Mr. Francis Crossman. Thank you so much for joining us, Francis. How are you doing today? Jason, I'm fantastic. Although I got to tell you, it's super weird not being in Vegas right now. So <laughs> just to kind of get into the Vegas mood, uh, I got a couple things going on here. Oh, got yeah. my badge, right? Nice. Uh, and you know Adobe always brings the bling. That's right. Got oh, my trade nice. show shirt. Oh, sweet. I right. loved that era of the shirt, too. The blue. Yeah, this that is from like two years two ago. Two years ago. I loved um, those. Yeah, yeah, and of yeah. course, I got my blazer, so I look good in customer meetings. Very slick, Plenty yes. Plenty of business cards. Water and chapstick. <laughs> so I am feeling ready for this sort of like Vegas, not Vegas. Vegas, anyway, not Vegas. I'm feeling yes. good. Awesome. Well, again, so... We're here today primarily to talk about, I'm sure many of you saw the titles, it's about smarter and faster workflows in Premiere. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna focus a lot on our usage and the leveraging of Adobe Sensei, which is our AI machine learning technology. Um, and of course, you know, in combination with that and having these technologies allowing us to do this, people consistently ask, well, to get the best performance, the best experience, what kind of machine should I be using, right? I know you get this, you see this on the forums. We get this question all the time, right? So recently, very recently, we finally updated our hardware, what do we, what do we actually call it? The hardware optimization guide. And I thought real quickly I would pull this up before we get into all the Sensei stuff because this is... This is super cool, and this is something that, again, um, we've had in the past, but I want to point out, you know, we had a lot of people who would look at these things, and traditionally when you see hardware guides like this, they're always about minimums, right? Like the minimum requirements. In the video space, and Francis, you can back me up on this. Do you want oh, to yeah, hear, I mean, do you want to hear minimum? Do you want to hear minimum? No, anything? not at no, all. Of course What not. we want to do is we want to basically recommend what's going to give you a good experience. And sometimes that means more than the bare minimum. So while 16 gigs of RAM might get you there, 32 is going to give you a much better experience. And so we've gone through and kind of revamped this whole page to basically uh, come from that point of view. What's going to give you a good experience? Yes. And that's, Again, this is kind of the transparent nature of the way that we're approaching things today and for some time now. And I have to say right from the start, I mean, this used to be, it used to say like many, we weren't unique in this space, eight gigs of memory. And as Francis just said, that's not gonna be a great, that's not a great experience for anyone. Not, certainly not for working in 4K, which most of our mobile devices even default to today. But if you're working with, you know, beyond 4K, it like just don't bother. Yes, there's proxy workflows. Yes, we have fractional playback options. But again, the overall experience in general is not going to be great. So right at the start, we recommend 32 gigs. Can you do it with 16? Sure. Can you do it with eight? Yes, if you're doing 10 to 1080p or sub that. But this is really 
kind of where you want to be or what you should be aspiring to in terms of acquisition for having a really solid experience, regardless of the format or frame size or aspect ratio that you're working on. Got some great stuff here uh, around storage hard drives, explanations around like, what is the media cache, uh, GPU? Again, this was another one where I'm so proud of what the team put together, at least four gigs of VRAM, right? That's in 2020. I mean, I, I, I can remember when, what was it? It was the, uh, the NVIDIA, the 1080 card, right? Was that it? The 1080 card, the 1080i or something? That, I'm trying to remember the GTX yeah, 1080. I, I, I don't remember specifically. Yeah, yeah, I know so many. But the GTX yeah. 1080, I think it was, and it had like eight gigs of RAM. This is already five years ago or something, and it was like, oh, this is just unapproachable. And it was very expensive. You know, now you're seeing these cards with 16, 32, 64 gigs of dedicated video RAM. So again, can you do it with less than four? Sure. If you're going to be working in 4K or again in a mix of 1080 and 4K and other formats you really want about four gigs of dedicated video memory. We have GPU acceleration for that reason. So the smaller your GPU, the less performant the playback of real-time things is going to be. Um, I can't emphasize it enough. And then again, going into like processors and things, um, I love that we're mentioning both, of course, Intel, Core i7, i9, as well as AMD equivalents, right? I mean, clock speeds, all this stuff is in here. I'm not going to go through it all. We don't, we don't need to go through every part of it. I'm going to bring up the URL again so everybody can see and get that down. Helpx.adobe.com is where you can find lots of information. Just wanted to kind of start with this because this, this is awesome. And this is legit. And if you're like, oh, you know, thinking about getting a system, I wonder, mm, maybe that's the one I want. This is what you want to do. This is what you want to be using, okay? Yes, and I can see somebody's already going, oh, look at all the tabs up there. That's right, looking at all the news from all the people. All right, so here's what we're going to start with. Um, we've got three main Sensei things that we're going to talk about today. And Francis, I think you wanted me to kind of kick it off with, I think this was actually our first introduction of Sensei and Premiere with auto-ducking, right? Was that the first, the first Sensei? Yeah, I think it was. But, um, you know, when we talk about Sensei, Sensei is all about trying to help you automate the tedium. And so right. we're going to take care of a lot of things that are going to get you to the finish line faster, get you to great faster, and uh, so that you're left with more time to do creative stuff. Right. So, you know, of course, editing is world class in Premiere, but it's those sort of extra finishing steps that you really need to make your project awesome and great. And so there's a couple of different categories, right? Right. Audio color, graphics, that kind of stuff. And specifically today, we want to talk about audio, graphics, and, and then one other one, a little, you know, plus one, which is auto reframe. Right. So within audio, auto ducking is a really great way to get to a quick mix when you have music and dialogue in there. And, uh, you know, Jason, I think I'm, I'm going to ask you to demo that one because okay. uh, you've yeah. got the system to do it. Yeah. And then I'll do uh, the color and uh, auto reframe. Perfect. Okay, awesome. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to switch back over to my screen and give a really quick, quick explanation and showcase of auto ducking. Now, again, we got a lot of new users, particularly on Adobe Live, so you might not be familiar with this terminology. Basically, it's the concept of having dialogue and music together. And when you've got dialogue and music, if you want the dialogue to be heard clearly, traditionally what you would do is you do what's called ducking or attenuating or lowering the volume of the music, right? So whenever there's talking, the music should duck down, right? Literally, like a literal term there. Dialogue happens when there's no, t when he stops talking, music comes back up. Talking again, duck, ducks down, back up. Now, in the traditional workflow, this is also known as sidechain ducking. We are now leveraging Sensei to automatically detect not only when the dialogue is happening, but what we refer to as the threshold levels, the point at which that music needs to be ducked down. It can detect all of these things automatically using some machine learning here. And it does the work for you. And it keyframes all of those operations for you so that you don't have to go in and manually draw all those duct keyframes to you know, eliminate or attenuate the music over your entire timeline. So the way that this happens is via the essential sound panel. Now, of course, those of you, I have many people always ask, what, what view is he in? What, uh, what workspace? We have a dedicated workspace for audio. 
that you can find up at the top of Premiere. If you don't see it there, you can also find it under the workspace menu here. But Or you can just access the essential sound from, uh, from the window menu as well. The way that this works is you basically tell Premiere what dialogue tracks you have and what music tracks you have. You tag them, which is basically selecting them and then clicking these buttons. That's it. You can see we've got four basic types, dialogue, music, sound effects, and ambience. I've already gone in and selected all of my dialogue, and I've gone in and selected the music. And this is for um, a trailer, a documentary trailer, that I actually started cutting on Adobe Live uh, just a few weeks ago uh, around my friend Fuzzy Island, who's this classic blues artist. So I'm just going to let you hear what this sounds like raw, unmixed, without the auto ducking, so you can hear what I'm talking about. We're going to play a little bit of this, and it's got a lot of text inserts. We didn't get, we didn't finish the, the trailer just yet, but just listen to the sound and kind of what's happening. My name's Fuzzy Island, and um, I play music, or write music, write stories, tell stories. I mean, that's the thing about Fuzzy. He's always listening. Every note that he plays, there's a purpose. You can just go around and find. Okay, so you can you can hear the talking, right? You can hear the talking, but we. It, it, we, we need to adjust the volume levels of the music. Now, I see someone's already asking, could Sensei become smart enough to duck conflicting frequencies only? Um, I, it, I imagine we could do that in the future. Now, remember, there's, there, there's an issue there because when you've got music and dialogue, there are going to be repeat frequencies. That's just the nature of it. Mm. So while that is one way to do it via EQ, and tr uh, traditionally, if you didn't have a sidechain duck, I might say to someone, yes, you can do what's called kind of the, the scoop of mids. That's actually not the best way because you're, you're going to sacrifice a bit of that detail in the music, but it is one way to do it. That's actually a really great question. I'm gonna show you an even easier way. I'm gonna go ahead and tap music and it automatically selects my music track down here. So I've already tagged it. And inside Essential Sound under music, see it detects it as music, you can see that we have a section called ducking. Very simple, very easy. And hold on, I'm just gonna adjust the view here so you can see the audio clip a little bit better. Just make this a little bit taller, a little bit wider, so you can see, because the keyframing part is where this gets really cool. Okay, so you can see you can duck against multiple sources. In this case, by default, we're going to duck against dialogue. And then you have three basic settings here. The first is the sensitivity. That's that threshold that I was talking about. I'm going to leave that as it is. Then you have duck amount, all right? Now this is defaulting to minus 18 dB. That's really a lot. That's going to get very quiet. So I traditionally put this to around, I usually start at around minus nine-ish, which is, you know, a pretty decent amount of ducking again to kind of still keep the music there, but make everything else very intelligible, very audible. And then the last thing here is the fade. And the fade time is when it begins to duck, how quickly it ducks down when talking happens and then how quickly it returns to its normal volume level. 800 milliseconds, eight tenths of a second, is, is, is a fairly non-aggressive setting. So let's try it at that setting, okay? I'm simply going to click on Generate Keyframes. Sensei goes in, analyzes all of that, and look at what has just happened. It is now keyframed and created all of those volume ramps automatically identifying where the dialogue is and where the music is, and here's what we've got now. I'm just gonna play it from here, all right? And folks who did what you did, you know, talk about stuff that you cared about. He's going to find something. He's going to have some element that you're going to connect with. That's going to keep you listening. When everything is working, when the timing is just right. Yeah, that's, that's it. magic, Jason. It's magic. It's magic. It, it's magic. Now, again, um, could you go in and do this yourself? Of course. This trailer is a minute. There is probably 15 bits of dialogue. So that means 15 times you'd have to go in there, you know, four keyframes each, right, to create your little curve. I guess you could do it with three if you're bezying. Um, but that's at a time loss to you. This does it automatically. Now, here's the really amazing thing. Of course, all of this, despite being machine learned and computer controlled, is fully editable. So if you want to adjust these keyframes manually, 
you can do that. As I mentioned, if you want to actually make them Bezier's uh, as opposed to linear in this case, you can do that, okay? You can modify this in any which way possible. And you can then, now when you do it manually, you're now kind of breaking the sensei thing because now you're kind of in a manual mode. But to go back into a sensei mode, you're just gonna click generate again. So let's say that we wanted to actually duck it by the default, like before, which was minus 18 or something like that. I just choose generate keyframes, and now you can see it has done it again, right? It has done its own thing. Let's say we wanted to do even something more extreme, generate keyframe 30 dB, right? And you can see now how it's readjusted those values. It's awesome, it's time saving, it's fully editable, it's fully flexible, and it's leveraging Adobe Sensei. And that is the power of the auto duck. Quack. And you know, Jason, where I find auto ducking comes in really handy is when you're doing a rough cut and you want to get it together really quick. Right. You want to do a quick sound mix so you can show it to a producer or something. And then invariably they're going to come back and say, okay, that's great, but let's take out this scene. Let's add another scene. Right. And if you were doing all that manually, all of that work that you'd done auto ducking would need to be completely done over again by hand but you just hit regenerate keyframes and Sensei is gonna figure it out for you. Yep, I mean, it, and that's the thing is it's, I love the fact that it's editable, but like you said, there's so many uses for this. Look, any, any, any you know, pro sound mixer very rarely is going to leave everything to machine learning, right? As good as all of these algorithms are getting, just like color, just like anything, you're always going to yeah. want to manually tweak. So what's really nice about this, we give you that option. I see a lot of people, Eric Crosby and uh, ha Havri Munkin is saying like, yes, frequency ducking should be next. Okay, we hear you, <laughs> all right? We've also got, I can post this in the chat when Francis is going, we have our, uh, uh, oh, I just forgot the name of it. What is our feature request site? Adobe Voice. I'll oh, post yeah. the Adobe User Voice, Voice link. User Voice, it's thank User you. Voice. Uh, I'll post the link in just a second. So you can request that if it's not already in there. But yes, I mean, it's it's amazing. Tim saying groovy. Yeah, yeah. dear, awesome. All right, very, very cool. And Bernadette. if you want to know how to get to user voice, uh, just from Premiere Pro, go to the help menu and go down to provide feedback. And you're there. It takes you to the site. Even faster. You give us all the feedback you want. I'm going to show you that right now just so that people can see it. Here you go. Help menu, provide feedback. It's going to take you right there. Also, again, your in-app tutorials, online tutorials, lots of resources to get you started. Yeah. Okay. And so when you, when you go in there, uh, look to see if somebody else already had that same idea and upvote their idea. Exactly. Right. It's really yeah. important. The search is good and it's important to take note of the voting too. And if you don't see your feature, that's your opportunity. Okay. So moving on now, I know we're going super quick, but we've got so many cool things to show you. Yes, um, we do. Next up, we're going to talk about... Uh, color matching, right, Francis? Yeah, yeah, let's do color. Okay, so I'm gonna switch over to you. And there we are. And I'm actually gonna take myself out for just a minute and let you uh, let you drive it. And I'll pop back in periodically. Okay, cool, cool. All right. So I've got this sequence here and I've just got a little region marked which has uh, some problems in it. Let me just play this and uh, we can spot the problems together. So there's three clips. Uh, the first two look like they match. And then the third, the woman with dark hair, uh, it's got a color cast. It looks very blue and it doesn't look like it belongs in the sequence of shots. So this is a perfect candidate for some color correction. So the very first thing I'm going to do is jump into the color workspace and it opens up our beloved Lumetri color tab, which we, we all know and love. And of course, you could go into the basic section and start trying to figure it out yourself. We've got a temperature slider. If you think, oh, this is a white balance problem. You know, it's blue. Let me push it to orange. OK, let's see if that matches. Well, not quite. So you could keep on tweaking, but there is a better way to do this. So I'm just going to reset this, and I'm going to go down into color wheels and match. And what I'm going to use is a, another Adobe Sensei feature, which is going to figure out how to match these shots for me. So the first thing I need to do is jump into comparison view mode. And there's a couple of ways to do that. You can either hit the comparison view mode right here in the color wheels section of the Lumetri panel, or you can go down here to the button bar underneath your program monitor. They both do the same thing, and they bring up this view. What this is, this is the comparison view mode. 
And you can see on the right hand side, I've got my current shot and that's just whatever shot is underneath the playhead. On the left hand side is my reference and that's going to be essentially this window. Think of it like a duplicate of your current sequence. And why we need that is you need to find a reference shot to match to. So I can scrub through here and find uh, something that I think that that this shot should look like. So I think this is a good candidate. Um, there's also a couple of different views here, but you know what? We'll get into that in a second. I'm just gonna go, go for broke and hit apply match here over in the color wheel section. And Sensei is going to analyze the shot. It's gonna look at the shadows, midtones, and highlights and figure out what does it need to do to make these two shots look like they belong together. And so you can see what it did here. It actually dialed some values <clears throat> into the shadows, midtones, and highlights. And uh, specifically, it looked like it pushed midtones kind of towards orange. And that's kind of what you would expect. And what's really awesome about this, um, similar to auto ducking that Jason just showed, is it's not a black box effect. Meaning that it's not like you just hit the button it does something and then either you like it or you don't like it, it actually allows you to edit those parameters after the fact. So if you thought that, oh, maybe um, Sensei didn't get it quite right, I think this should actually be a little more yellow, <clears throat> you can totally do that. And so you're always in creative control. But I think that Sensei did a totally fine job and let's jump out of comparison view mode and just play back these three shots. And there we have it. Basically with one button press, I made this sequence of shots visually look like they belong together. And this is a huge time savings. That's really nice. Could you do, yeah. um, could you do the quick effects bypass so we can kind of see the before? Yeah, totally. Yeah. So I'm gonna jump into comparison view mode and there's this other a uh, button here, which is shot or frame comparison. And what that does is it allows you to compare the shot to another shot or the shot to itself. And here's why that's interesting. If I turn off the effect, you can see before and after. Actually, this is a little bit backwards. Um, I should have turned off the effect before I went into this mode, but you still get the idea. So we've got uh, blue and the nice looking uh, shot here. And really I also cool. want to point out that you can go into these other modes, these onion skinning modes, and you can wipe across the screen to basically get a really good idea of specific points in the shot that you need to compare. So with the line right across her face here, you can quite clearly see uh, where it was blue and uh, now it's orange. And of Love course, it. you can use that comparison, that uh, onion skinning effect uh, to show other shots as well. So this is kind of fun. You can get yeah. interesting looking effects there. Sometimes it's fun just to play with. You know? Well, and I love, actually, I love doing what, what you're just doing there where you're doing that kind of the, 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 uh, the horizontal comparison, because then you can really compare like skin tone or just overall lighting and, yeah. and, and, and hue. And especially if you've got shots that are outside, but different times of day or different locales where... Again, that's kind of the challenge to a non-colorist. It really, it really provides a very quick idea of what you need to tweak, especially if you need to make some tweaks, like in the highlights or the shadows or the you know mid-tone contrast or whatever. Yeah, and yeah. again, if it doesn't nail it, you can you know adjust it to your heart's content. You can also kind of use it to start to learn how you might approach color balancing shots yourself if you wanted to do it by hand. You can kind of see what Sensei did here and then try to recreate that. Um, and there's one other point that I want to bring up with the shot match, color match, which is the face detection. So face detection uh, is important because, and this is, this is really the heart of the Sensei magic right here. Before it performs the analysis and does the match uh, to dial in the colors, it's going to look and find faces within your content. And with face detection enabled, it's going to uh, prioritize tones that it finds in those facial regions. So let me turn it off and apply the match and you'll see kind of what happens. 
it didn't do a super awesome job because you you can see that the backgrounds here are quite different. He's got this like bright sky. She's got a dark background, uh, and it sort of is getting confused by all that. But by turning face detection on, it's going to give higher priority to those face regions, and you're going to get a really nice looking match. Face detection, love face detection. Yeah. <laughs> so. Yeah, so that that's a color match. Uh, I love it. I actually, I personally worked on this feature uh, and I did a ton of testing on this feature and it's uh, it's kind of like my baby. I love to promote it, you know? Yeah, well, and I was going to ask you, so like as a colorist, again, because we make these tools to make them, I mean, I'm the first to say when I show this, and I show this all the time, um, I could... It would be almost impossible for me, certainly in a timely fashion, to do even some of the subtle matching that you just did, because I'm not a colorist. You, as someone who is, yeah. do, I mean, do you still find yourself and other pros like, actually, it's it's a great way to kind of get you at least in the ballpark sooner, oh, yeah. started sooner, and then it's it being oh, editable. Totally. Yeah, yeah. There's no shame in taking shortcuts. Yep, I love like, that. Like, yeah, I identify as a colorist, but am I going to use the color match? Absolutely. Right. <laughs> right. Yeah. But I'd like to save myself a little post-production time or sure. not save time. I think I'll not save time this week. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, Something there's no another auto says. feature in here that you guys should be aware of too. And while this one isn't sensei driven, the auto tone right. is oh, yeah. uh, a good way to sort of get your exposure and contrast into a reasonable reasonable uh yeah. shape now i don't know i might be throwing you a, a curveball here because i know the the auto toning in lightroom uh as of a year or two ago that is actually a sensei drip. that that's going out to the web and like analyzing tone and light and hue of yeah. similar type imagery and then returning back a result this ours isn't doing that it's just kind of doing no. it based on some kind of particular algorithm but yeah yeah this, yeah. this is just algorithmic but I will say that the Sensei team is always looking for fun challenges, and you know, my goodness, they're they're a bunch of really smart people, oh, and yeah. this is exactly the sort of thing that they might be interested in trying to tackle, and that would be uniquely suited to Sensei. So, right. you know, again, to plug the user voice, if you think that's an awesome idea, go on a user voice and say, "Yes, I want Sensei Auto Tone." That's sweet. All right, man. Yeah. So what have we got up next? Moving on. So once you've got your sound and your color looking just totally awesome, of course, you're going to want to deliver this thing. And uh, when you deliver, it's pretty frequent that you're going to have to deliver to multiple different platforms. How many people can relate to this? You finish a piece and it, you know it's widescreen, 16 by 9, as you do. And then the producer comes in and says, OK, that's awesome. Um, just crank me out a version for Instagram, for Facebook, for Twitter. And you're thinking to yourself, oh my goodness, those are all different aspect ratios. I'm going to be here for a week, just like trying to figure all this out. Well, auto reframe aims to automate that exact problem and make it really fast and easy. So let me just dive right in and show you, let me show you the old bad way first, which is you might go and duplicate your sequence. And then you'd open up your sequence, you go into sequence settings, and then you're going to change your uh, resolution. And at this point, you have to kind of remember um, what the resolution is, or you have to go out to the internet or pull out a calculator. Um, I happen to remember that 607 by 1080 is um, the vertical resolution. But we immediately have a problem here, which is that this uh, story about a skater has no skater in it. So then you might have to go in and scoot things around and you'd have to do this for every shot. And that's just ridiculous. This uh, dry Vegas air is getting to me. <laughs> yes, you can't see me, but I, I've already finished bottle water of one. one yeah, totally. I, th I think the Vegas thing is getting, my brain is not working. First yeah. bottle of water consumed, second uh, second hydro flask underway. All right. <laughs> hey, while you're sheltering at home, stay hydrated. That's right. Uh, okay, so, so what I just showed you is for chumps. Let me show you the smart way to do it. So I'm going to right click on the sequence and I'm going to choose auto reframe. So let me just zoom in there so you can see that menu item in all its glory. Auto reframe sequence. 
So here is what it brings up. It brings up this handy dialogue, which essentially you can get away with choosing one thing and then hitting create, which is the aspect ratio. So I'm going to choose vertical 9 by 16 because that's uh, what I want for this particular thing. The motion preset, most of the time, you can just leave it default. But what this is actually saying is tell the Sensei uh, algorithm how much motion to expect from your content. So if you're doing something like action sports, uh, maybe faster motion is a good choice. If you're doing a sit down interview and it's essentially a lock off, uh, slower motion maybe is, is good. But I'm just going to leave it at default and hit create. And a bunch of things happened um, so quickly you probably didn't even notice. It duplicated the sequence. You can see here the parentheses 9 by 16. It automatically changed the sequence resolution to be the correct resolution for that 9 by 16 aspect ratio. And on every one of my clips in the sequence, it added this auto reframe effect. And what that is doing, this is the sensei part here, uh, that is analyzing the content in your footage and finding what it thinks humans would be interested in looking at. And it's no surprise that humans are interested in looking at other humans. They're interested in looking at signs. They're interested in looking at motion. Um, and so it went through and it found all the interesting stuff to look at throughout this entire sequence and shifted the position of each clip accordingly. So this is very cool. And again, you know, harping on the fact of, or on the topic of keeping you in creative control, it's not a black box effect. So if you find a case where you think that Sensei didn't quite nail it, like right here, for example, you know, the skateboarder starts to kind of go out of the frame. Hey, by the way, Jason, I think you could, you could do this, right? Oh yeah, trip. that's oh totally. Oh yeah, that's yeah, like me too. yeah, nothing. <laughs> no, yeah. no right now. not not a chance. Um, yeah. So with the keyframes, uh, with the way that Sensei is handling doing the positioning, it just puts keyframes on the motion position parameter. And if you don't like what it did, you can totally override it. Sensei is not going to get his feelings hurt. It's there to serve you and save you time so you can be creative. So if I decide that I want to scoot this over a little bit, no problem, just scoot it over. You see how it added another keyframe. And then when I play back this shot, you can see that the skateboarder stays in the frame. So that's a pretty, pretty awesome time savings, really, honestly, because what if you then also needed to create a square version? You know, I can do this again do the square version. Sensei is going to do its thing, analyze it, readjust everything, and boom, I've got a square version. And probably, at least with this pretty simple content, uh, I don't need to adjust anything. Just send this out to Instagram, and uh, you know, I'm a star. I'm getting likes. So cool. Yeah. So cool. So now I know, you know, and it's funny, I'm seeing so many people saying, and this, this is kind of proof positive. This was released uh, in November last year at Max. In fact, I got to, mm -hmm. I got to, uh, to showcase this at Max last year. So this has been out now for a little over five, five and a half months or so, seeing so many people that are like, oh my God, I, I can't wait to try this. Has it, you know, I've got, I've got to do some vertical stuff tonight, or I've been trying to find a better way to do this for social. I mean, that's the thing is these things and, and, and they will, they're consistently getting better. And I know, I, I don't know how much we can talk about some of the new things that we're bringing to auto reframe. Uh, but I mean, I know there's a lot of people asking, well, what, what more can we expect from it? And I think the key point yeah. here is, and this is why you're here. We're always, we're always working on these things. We're always trying to add new features. And that's partly where we get a lot of this from user voice. Mm -hmm. um, but even me doing daily live streams, you know, I'm, I'm feeding a lot of that stuff back to, to, to you, to the teams. And like, th we're hearing this a lot. We, people would really love to see this stuff happen. Yeah, I mean, there's a couple of improvements that I can talk about right now that you should expect to see in coming releases. And that's uh, performance of auto reframe. Uh, I don't know if you can really tell from my examples here, but it is actually really fast, but it's going to get even faster. 
And um, so fast to the point, in fact, where we're going to get rid of the analyzing banner that uh, covers your image. That's Very similar awesome. to the warp stabilizer banner. But, uh, you know, it's going to be so fast that we don't need it anymore. So get rid of that. Love also, that. Uh, the Sensei team is going to be doing some smart caching, uh, which basically means that if you've already analyzed uh, frames of a clip and then you, you, know, you extend the clip uh, or, or do some editing there, um, it's not going to have to reanalyze the whole clip again. So, yeah, lots of improvements uh, coming soon. Sensei uh, team hard at work. Yes. And I just wanted to point out, Eric uh, Eric Philpot was just uh, one of our colleagues was mentioning, and this is something that uh, I know, Hi, Eric. And, and, and Eric Addison has mentioned that he does this all the time. And this is something that I've done and do religiously. This goes back to uh, color matching. So, you know, we were showing matching cool. from... You know, matching cameras from a you know from a shoot, right? And that's 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 a primary thing because all camera, even the two of the same cameras, could look different, right? Oh um, yeah. But what if you have a look that you're trying to achieve? Like I want my film to look like Blade Runner twenty forty nine, or I want it to look like, oh, yeah. et cetera. You can take a still, drop that in the timeline, and use that as your reference for matching. And suddenly, you know, you've got that. You know, in the case of like Blade Runner, they get that like just bluish magenta futuristic hue, you know, like with kind of blown out highlights in a good way. Yeah, um, yeah, everything. Exactly. Yeah. A and uh, again, as a non-colorist, I'm the, I'm the first to, very honest about this, not achievable without color match. I, I mean, maybe after an hour or eight, but it would still be probably not as good as what Sensei can do just to get me there. And then a couple of subtle tweaks, you know, again, yeah. maybe it's in the highlights, maybe it's in the contrast for a particular uh, mid-tone section. It's it's such a rewarding thing to be able to do it so quickly and get you there. And then the other thing is, which we didn't really talk about, is that you can save these as presets. So oh, yeah. you can come back to these, you can you can save them out as .look or .cube files, right? I mean, there's this is just part of the Lumetri, um, Lumetri color in general. But the big thing is saving those presets and being able to reuse those matched looks another time in another session. Yeah, so if you wanted to match a movie look, uh, the way that you would achieve that is just like go out to the internet, find a representative still, put that on your timeline. And then when you go into the comparison view mode, make sure that you're parked on that still. And then when you hit apply match, it's gonna try to make it look like that still. Um, and then as Jason pointed out, you know, save a preset, call it Blade Runner or Matrix or whatever film you're trying to match and uh you've got it for reuse awesome well francis we are just about out of time i'm kind of perusing uh the chats here to see if there's anything our team has been very hard at work today uh a couple awesome. shouts out to to megan and to marjorie i mentioned eric we've got patrick palmer Love you guys. many of you will know patrick also part of the premiere team the man the man the myth the legend patrick palmer great to see you uh, so many people in the chats. Duran Gleaves is with us over on YouTube. So a huge thanks to all of my Adobe colleagues. I uh, want to point out that uh, I'm just going to cut over to the schedule here quickly. Coming up next uh, at 1030 Pacific time, we've got Alyssa Salter uh, from FBE. You will know FBE from their YouTube channel, which currently sports nothing major, just around 34 million followers, uh, subscribers, and uh where she's going to be showing you some amazing stuff. They are sort of very well known for their react videos. You know, kids react to Beatles for the first time. You know, kids react to blah, 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 all those things. So she's going to be talking about this, talking about her workflow, how kind of Premiere has really changed the game for them. And uh, we really hope you stick around and check that out. Again, thank you so much, Francis, for joining today. My and pleasure. Thank, and thank you, everyone, for watching. The chats are going to keep going. As always, I mentioned, if you've got more questions that we couldn't get answered here, you can always hit me up at Beetlejace on Twitter. And of course, daily, we've got streams for you. Oh, and I wanted to also plug for the video people. Francis and I were just talking about this. We've got something on Adobe Live called Daily Creative Challenges. And over the past year or so, these things have really blown up, largely in the Photoshop, XD and now Illustrator space. Very happy to announce that uh, a week from Monday, the week of the 27th of April, we're going to have our first week-long daily creative challenge for video. So 
This is super cool because one, we're gonna provide you with a bunch of footage and stuff. Two, you're gonna get some basic instruction, but this is a way for you to share your content, get input from others in the community and from Adobe, uh, Adobe moderators. And it's just kind of a fun thing to do. So if you're, again, at home, like most of us, working from home, mm -hmm. trying to get inspiration, the Daily Creative Challenge for video is an awesome way to do that, to really get started. And I'm gonna be covering color matching, auto ducking, and many of the things that we've been talking about. So thank you again. We will see you back here on Adobe Live, Behance, Premiere Pro, Facebook, Twitter, Periscope, and I th if, uh, YouTube, If I oh, the Creative Cloud YouTube channel. We'll see you in about 20 minutes. Thanks so much, everyone, for watching. Have a great rest of your day. See you in about 20. Take care. Bye-bye. Thank you.